and I will be doing a series of lessons to explore Thai classical dance with you all. And hopefully by the end of the lessons, you'll either want to start practicing the dance or you'll gain an interest in the Thai performing arts. And so this first lesson is going to be an introduction and let's get right into it. So what is it? It is a very ancient um, art form and it was used to communicate to um, with the spirits of our ancestors um, and with God. And it was performed during religious ceremonies and royal ceremonies as well. Um, it was even performed to do things like ask for rain. And now it is used to entertain. And before, actually, the Princess Nailson, um, the Princess named Popa Devi was actually the one who led the movement to make the dance available for the entire public to learn and perform because before it was only for the royals and government officials, like ambassadors to watch and also for, um, you know, religious ceremonies as they did before. And so let's watch a new practice video of the Royal Ballet. And we're just gonna look at their, um, their posture and um, the music that's played during practice. Okay, so first with their posture. So as you can see, their fingers are bent and very flexible and they're bent backwards. Um, and so, you know, this takes a lot of um, hours of stretching and um, practicing to get that kind of flexibility in your fingers, as well as um, the flexibility with their back, like their backs are all arched and um, their head is leveled. And you can also see that their toes are also arched as well. And so in a later lesson, we'll be going over street food. But for now, um, let's also listen to the music that's being played in the background. So as you can hear the music is playing, um, it's actually being played live by musicians. And this is typically what happens during practices and um, performances. The music is actually played by musicians like live. And you can hear a xylophone being played and another instrument called chung, which is like two metal discs kind of being clapped together, which helps the musicians stay at the right tempo. And you'll see that the dancers are all together. And um, right here is actually their teacher. And yeah, that's kind of how practices go. And um, yeah, so <laughs> now we're gonna move on to the next topic which is how each generation of dancers is connected. So like I said earlier, um, my classical dance uh, was used to be performed during religious ceremonies, typically. Um, and so that carries on to today. So today, um, dances are still performed at religious ceremonies and a lot of dances have religious meaning. Um, and so there are also traditions associated with dance and these traditions tend to be religious as well and these traditions help to connect each generation of dancers and so when I move my generation is like if I were to be one generation and if I had students that would be the next generation and my teachers would be the generation before me and so um, one of these traditions is how each perform before each performance Dancers will pray and have a ceremony to pay respect and honor the dance, the spirits of dance, as well as their um, the dancers that came before them and their former teachers. And so let's watch a video on what this looks like. <laughs> So as you can see in this video, um, there is just a line of 
partners um, and me that just food that's leading up to this altar right here. And as a way, in a way, like this kind of acts as a pathway for this, this spirit. And on the altar, we have, which is just going to skip forward a little bit. Um, these are all crowns and masks that are going to be used by the dancers during the performance. And um, it's placed here because they represent the spirits of dance. And so when a dancer takes on a role in the performance, they're not just assuming the role, but um, they're also being passed down from previous dancers. And they're also taking on the um, embodying the spirit, the dance spirit that's like associated with that role, <laughs> if that makes sense. Um, so yeah, uh, before each practice, each performance, the dancers will take these um, incense sticks and uh, pray. And later in the video, you, you'll hear um, music being played in the background. And I'll just keep skipping forward. And yeah. And so they basically just hold a ceremony um, and they pray for the performance, but also to pay respect to the dancers. So, yeah. And so as you can see, there's a very deep connection between each dancer um, and from the dancer to their teacher, dancers to their teachers, and across each generation as well. So, um, I seen in that video, there were many different types of crowns. And an example of one of these crowns is also an Akhara crown. And so, and as seen in that video, um, there are many different types of crowns in dance. And one of these crowns is the Apsara crown, which is seen on the left. And another tradition is the how the crown and roll is passed down to the next dancer. So for Apsara, one dancer is typically chosen in each dance group to be the lead Apsara. And that means that this role is very special and requires a lot of dedication and practice to be able to perform that role. And so let's watch a video of how um, this role and the crown passed down to the next dancer. Since her first show, she has been performing the dance almost every day. She is only 165 centimeters in height, even though the minimum for the height of a lead dancer is 170 centimeters. But thanks to her hard work and efforts, she has become Anne Sofia Rita's best student. Before each performance, Sao Paulo pays tribute to the previous masters. This is not only a tradition, but also a rule for dancers. The accessories and costumes of previous Apsara dancers are handed down to their successors. As soon as Sao Paulo puts them on, she becomes the incarnation of Apsara. Hey, so some of the words that he used, like at the end he said incarnation, um, which basically means like they are like the embodiment or they are representing a certain deity, which means god or goddess or spirit. And so, you know, for her, she's the incarnation, like you said, or the embodiment of the Apsara um, goddess. And so, yeah, so that's kind of how the crown and the role is passed down um, from like the former Apsara to so, yeah. <laughs> um, now, some closing remarks. So, today we just learned about how each dancer is like, very deeply connected to other dancers, their former dancers, and um, their teachers. And this is a connection that exists across each generation. Um, we also just got a little um, peek at what practices look like and as well as um, different ways that different places where the dance is performed and for what reasons 
so yeah, I hope you enjoyed. And um, during the next class, we'll be um, practicing the stretches. So yeah, I hope you enjoyed and stay tuned for the next lesson. Thank you. <laughs>